and uh, we'll start in a few minutes with, as I said, uh, the executive director of UN Women. I believe there's somebody already arriving. Yeah. Uh, I was just Excellent. We are all here. Pardon. Oh, oh, I was, oh, was excellent. Because I'm kind of, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fast walker. Yeah. So you can take your seats, all your seats, actually. Thank you very much. And uh, your mic will be um, automatically open, I understand, but also you can uh, press at the, yeah, at the bottom left and you have your mic open. So, excellent. We'll start a little bit, a uh, few minutes before. So again, thank you very much for being here today. We are about to start our press conference on gender equality and women's leadership for a sustainable world. We would like to welcome back to the briefing room her Excellency, the President of the General Assembly, Ms. Maria Fernandez Spinoza, and her guests for today, the Executive Director of UN Women, Ms. Pumzili Mlambunguka, and Ms. Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand. A, well, a warm welcome to you all. And again, we have 20 minutes, so let's start, and one question at a time. Thank you very much. Madam President, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very, very much, uh, dear friends uh, from the press corps here uh, at the UN. I'm sure you, uh, my two guests do not need to be introduced, but it is uh, a real honor to be surrounded by uh, powerful women, both uh, Pumzile and, and Helen Clark. Uh, I think we just were running back from uh, the informal meeting of uh, my uh, group of gender equality leaders uh, at the ECOSOC chamber this, this morning. It was really, uh, I, I would say, inspiring to see all these very powerful women uh, to speak about affirmative action, about the need for a quota system, about the need of uh, you know pulling all our efforts together to make sure that we really uh, craft societies uh, that do have gender parity. Because it is a matter of justice, because it is a demographic issue, we are 50% of the population. Uh, we discuss uh, how much more we need to do. Uh, this is a follow-up of the meeting I organized on the 12th of March. You might recall that we had 11 heads of state and government in that opportunity, 11 out of 19 or 20 Pumsile, heads of state and government uh, worldwide. It is really not enough, 193 countries and only uh, 19 heads of state and, and government. Uh, so uh, I, to repeat again, I'm, I, I will not summarize what happened this morning, but it was uh, really inspiring. Uh, we know, we know that there is a lot of work to do. Just now, as we speak, uh, there is uh, the second panel uh, sp uh, talking about the connection between gender parity, women's empowerment, and the delivery of the 2030 agenda. Mm -hmm. We just he heard very good news from ILO um, Director General, this new convention on violence and harassment mm -hmm. that includes, uh, includes gender-based uh, violence in the workplace. So I, I think that um, since it was uh, webcasted, I, I won't uh, just repeat uh, what um, all these uh, very uh, smart and talented and powerful women uh, have said uh, during the first panel and now as we speak uh, during the second uh, panel. Um, remember that I established this group of gender equality leaders. Uh, both are sitting, you know, side by side. Uh, you you listen, uh, hear me very often, so I would like to give them the floor. But just to recall that I, I put together these gender equality leaders. Uh, first of all, that um, to benefit from their experience uh, and to receive their guide and support throughout uh, my work as president of the General uh, Assembly. Uh, this has been extremely useful. Uh, you know that you have seen even some uh, optical changes here, no panel here at the UN uh, with no gender parity. We have pulled a little bit uh, the, the scale on the, on the other side. Uh, Usually our panels are 60%, 70%, and this morning 99%, uh, all, all, all female. And it is not only about aesthetics or optics. It is uh, our uh, point of views, uh, our experience, uh, our perspectives. 
uh, what we bring uh, to society. So I'm, I'm, I really have uh, a lot of notes here, but uh, just to tell you that um, this is not a choice. Uh, th this is an obligation if we want to build fairer, more sustainable, more democratic societies. We need to be part of the equation. Uh, and we need to be represented in the same way we are represented demographically. So without further ado, uh, I think that I will uh, give the floor to uh, Pumzile or Helen or... Thank yeah. you, Madam both, President. Both yes, we go ahead with... Uh, yeah, I don't know which... Uh, Ms. Pumzile. Pumzile, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, let's ask Pumzile about preparations of the Beijing Plus 25 process uh, that we're all very excited about. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam President, uh, for making sure that gender equality is front and center in your presidency. It's also uh, noteworthy that this particular meeting is happening on the sidelines of the general, um, sort of the high level political forum on sustainable development, because this is an issue that is also key to all the deliberations that we are having uh, this week. We have uh, people from capitals who represent parliament where women are underrepresented, who may be coming from cabinets where women are underrepresented, who uh, also are coming from institutions that support governments where women are underrepresented. And it's important to bring this issue to their attention. Underrepresentation of women in decision making bodies is one of the five critical areas that is a barrier to gender equality. And therefore, it is not a small matter. It is one of the issues that the World Economic Forum threatens to see us only achieving gender equality after 200 years. Now, that I hope frightens you a lot and it makes you want to work with us in order to make sure that you can put UN Women out of business because we would have achieved the mission and the objectives of UN Women. We, however, have seen interventions that can fast track uh, the representation of women using special measures and quotas. And there are countries where that has made a difference. In Tunisia, for instance, Local government uh, representation moved up to 47% in 2018 because of special measures. We have seen in Mexico that uh, special measures have also enabled the increase in the in, in achievement of parity. We have also seen uh, in Bolivia the same uh, happening. Mm -hmm. We've also seen leadership from the front by uh, the head of state facilitating gender equality in the sense that heads of state are able to appoint gender equal cabinets. And that is a decision of one person who can actually make a decisions that has fundamental impact on the positioning of women uh, in cabinets. We have also seen some governments and cabinets passing laws that mandate a 50-50 representation parliament. It has happened in UAE, not in the countries where you'd expect it naturally to, to happen, but also we have seen that uh, in some countries, because of the pressures of civil society activism, such as the USA, you have seen women's numbers in Congress increasing because women organized, lobbied, got together. So this is not mission impossible. It can be done, but we need to make all these choices, stay the course, and be consistent. And our de deliberations today is just to show that this is a fight we can win, but we do need to be deliberate about it. In next year, when we mark Beijing 25, we would like to highlight all of these possible intervention, including intergenerational leadership in which young people are also integrated acti actively. Mm -hmm. When we bring together civil society in July 2020, we will start in Mexico in May 2020, where we will work with young people and we will culminate in July in Paris, where again we will adopt action coalitions that will be focused on fast-tracking the implementation of the Beijing platform. And parity, parity, not just 30%, because that mediocrity has not served us. Parity will be also a critical issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Milambo Nguka. Now, Madam Prime Minister Helen Clark. Thank you. 
Well, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's not so often we have a woman president of the General Assembly. So it's a bonus to have uh, Maria <laughs> Fernanda and a special bonus that she has really grabbed the gender equality torch and used her presidency to advance this cause. And uh, she called together a group of gender equality leaders. I was very pleased to uh, be one of them and uh, also issued a call for action from the first meeting that they had uh, uh, in, in recent months. Uh, so the call for action is about addressing all the things that are holding back uh, women getting to uh, leadership positions, quite comprehensive and looking at the, the context of discriminatory laws, of violence, of uh, unequal access to a range of, of opportunities, uh, all important in getting women into a position where they can shoot for the leadership positions. But I'd like to underline, as uh, Pumzili uh, just did, uh, that we have some outstanding he for she models in uh, male leadership at the moment, in uh, uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Prime Minister of Canada, President uh, Kagame in Rwanda, Prime Minister of Spain, who said, you know, we're going to have gender equal cabinets. And actually, Spain went rather better than that to have 60% uh, women in, in, in the cabinet when Mr. Sanchez first uh, took office. Uh, but uh, I agree that uh, the quotas will speed up women in political uh, leadership positions fast. And those countries like Rwanda, which is one of a number which have adopted them for parliaments have uh, brought many women into leadership positions. The other point I'd like to make uh, briefly at this press conference is just how important the multilateral system is in pushing the gender equality uh, cause. Uh, you know, this, this institution here, the UN, uh, spawned the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, uh, which uh, pronounced that gender equality was, was a right. Uh, out of this system came the Convention on the Eradication of Discrimination Against Women, and member states are measured for compliance uh, against that. We have the great institutions, the Commission on the Status of Women, of course UN Women of, of uh, quite recent years to, to really uh, hold the flag, UNFPA's work, UNICEF's work for, for girls. You know, these very important normative statements and institutions need uh, support. And uh, one does get concerned when they come under attack, as the Commission on the Status of Women was, was really under attack uh, uh, this year. So a point I've made this morning is it's going to be extremely important uh, to rally support uh, for uh, UN Women's Leadership on the Beijing Plus uh, 20 conference next year and to really support for UNFPA's leadership of the Cairo Plus 20 conference on uh, population and development, which will take place in Nairobi uh, in uh, November. Uh, there are uh, loud voices out there that, which uh, are not positive for gender equality, but I think there's also a, a fresh sort of round of mobilisation of women who want to see change. Probably Me Too uh, was responsible for giving this a further push along. But the more familiar people become with the, uh, the facts and figures about how much we still lag on the journey to gender equality, the more I think it starts to mobilise new generations of, of young women uh, to, to fight for this. But let's underline that the UN's role is absolutely vital as a convening space, the normative statements, the key institutions, the, the conferences, uh, and they, they need support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. We're going to open for questions, and I would like you to please uh, state your media outlet, your name, and to whom your question is addressed to. We're going to start with Errol, and afterwards James. Errol, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Errol Avdovic, Fair Publica Press, New York. Uh, on behalf of the United Nations Correspondent Association, welcome. Uh, my question is for three of you. Uh, obviously, some are very concerned that the, uh, the sustainable development goals, including the, the appeals and everything that are going on, are not going to be fulfilled by two in the, within the agenda t uh, 2030. And what do you say on that? And I don't like to make a silly comparison, which is what is much more important in a sense of social issues and human rights between the, uh, uh, eradicating poverty or, or uh, you know, gender equality or so, but I'm asking you to address probably that. And also, do you think the time has come 
for torch for the Secretary General of the United Nations to be uh, passed to women, finally. Thank you, Errol. <laughs> Can I just say a word on the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a, an incredible agenda. I believe it's absolutely in the right direction, uh, but it needs a lot more commitment. Uh, now, if you look at some of the, the core economic and social goals on poverty, far from reaching eradication in 2030, we're looking at still 6% of the world's population being in extreme poverty uh, on the trends currently. Uh, the World Food Programme for the past three years has been reporting an increase in the absolute numbers of hungry people, whereas we're supposed to be aiming for eradication. I'll be speaking uh, at, at lunchtime on the UNESCO Global Education Monitoring Report, uh, which suggests that in 2030, uh, we will still have one in six of the six to 17 year old age cohort out of school. And yet the goal is to have everyone in that age cohort going through 12 years of education. I could go on, we're well short of uh, universal uh, healthcare and so on. Now there is a school of thought which I subscribe to, which is that it's time uh, also for the donor community to be focusing back in on the needs of those living in the most fragile contexts and the poorest states. Uh, because uh, people really are being left behind. Whole, whole communities, whole uh, nations are, are being left behind. But to, just to round it off with the point on gender equality, of course, women are poorer. Right? Women are less likely to be educated, less likely to have access to the full range of health services they need because of the fires that are whipped up around sexual and reproductive health and, and, and services. Uh, so there's a lot to do, and, and I would hope that the SDG uh, summit, which is a summit of the high-level political forum that the leaders come to, that, as Mr Guterres said with respect to the climate summit, don't bring a speech, come and tell us what you're going to do. Uh, because there's not enough action on climate or any other area of the SDGs. Just perhaps to briefly add to what Helen has said, uh, you know, very comprehensive response, but just to say that if you look at the two reports on achievements on the SDGs, you see that women and girls lag behind on every single sustainable development goal, everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, rural women, access to water and sanitation, access to decent work, etc., etc., etc. So there, there is a huge effort that we need mm -hmm. to do to scale up the pilot successes. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard many, yeah. you know, yeah. parity in cabinets, mm -hmm. uh, better numbers in parliaments, etc., etc. But we need to do much, much more and. Uh, social and economic rights then have a strong impact in, in political and civil rights at the same time. Mm -hmm. Helen said this morning, uh, uh, women's rights and parity it is, is about also uh, human rights, mm -hmm. and I think we should not forget that. I don't know if you want to... Okay, go ahead. James Bayes from Al Jazeera. Um, my question is to Helen Clark because she's not currently constrained by a UN role and she was a candidate to be Secretary General. So two very quick questions. Halfway through the current Secretary General's term, what would you say his report card is on gender parity? And my second question, you mentioned the CSW earlier this year. How worried are you about the backsliding from the US administration on gender issues? On gender parity, uh, the Secretary General's made a huge effort to appoint to the high level positions uh, many more women, and, and that is positive. Of course, in the multilateral system, there are a lot of uh, high positions as head of organisation, which the SG does not appoint. And my experience, and I'm sure Pumzili is going to the Chief Executive's Board, <laughs> was that, yes, where the Secretary General appoints, it's, it's looking a lot better. But there's a lot of specialised agencies out there where the, the member states are just not bringing women to the top at all. So member states need to focus attention not only on those appointments which come through SG and ratified by General Assembly and so on, uh, but, you know, look at these other many specialised agencies which um, are, are not seeing uh, women at the top. Uh, 
Secondly, yes, the reports from the CSW were very disturbing. Uh, the way in which the chair of it, the Deputy Permanent Representative Kenya, was was attacked and attacked uh, and attacked, um, and and that was that was organised. I think, uh, un unfortunately, this sort of global gag uh, that the US has on funding uh, to any organisation that really doesn't denounce abortion is, is very damaging uh, for, for women uh, because, you know, the full range of sexual and reproductive health and rights should be available and abortion is on that menu. Now, you know, of course, you know, with good family uh, planning and access to services, uh, most will never get to access that end of the, the spectrum. But it has to be there and it has to be safe. And to try and shut down this and shut down discussion and shut down funding and harm a great institution like UNFPA is, is very concerning for women. Thank you. My name is Abdul Hamid Sayham from the Arabic Daily Al-Quds Al-Arabi and my question is to Ms. Clark. Do you see some shortages of women who gained the Nobel Prize for Peace? Uh, I don't know how the statistics, but there are few women who won the Nobel for peace. There is a call now to offer your Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, the Nobel Prize for Peace, for the way, the uh, excellent way she handled the massacre of the Muslims in, uh, in, the, in that country. Do you support that call? Uh, there is about 100 or 200,000 signature to call for the Nobel Committee to offer her the Nobel Prize for Peace. What do you think on that? Thank you, Hamid. We're going to have another question before Ms. Clark answers that. Linda, go ahead, because you're going to have to leave in about four minutes. Linda, please. Thank you. This is in regard to family planning. Uh, there was a report a few years ago put out by um, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's office that high birth rates in certain countries were really impeding the attainment of certain SDGs. And so given that, I was wondering, how important do you see the provision of family planning to women who want it? I gather what I heard a few years ago, that there were about a quarter of a million women who would like it but don't have access. So what, what do you think can be done to accelerate the provision? Thank you. Well, f for me, it's about women having the choice and the power to determine their own lives. I would never say to any woman how many children they should have. That must be their choice, but they, they need the services that will then enable that, that, that choice. Uh, and it is uh, true that in many uh, low-income countries, governments are just struggling to, to fund uh, the services that are needed for this very large cohort of children and youth that are coming through, you know, calculate how many new classrooms you need every week, how many new clinics and so on. So, uh, but for me, put it back in the hands of women, give them real choice, make sure there's access to, to services. Um, on the issue raised about the New Zealand Prime Minister, count me as number one supporter of, of that, that initiative. Uh, we are very proud of Jacinda Ardern and the way that she stepped up to speak for all New Zealanders on the uh, terrible tragedy that occurred uh, in Christchurch. And uh, she deserves all the international recognition she's had for the inclusive approach and for the way in which the Muslim community in New Zealand was embraced and not made to feel that they had to cope with this on their own. No, New Zealand took it as something that, that we have to deal with and support the community through. Madam President, your final remarks and final considerations. I don't know if Mzile would like to add something and um, a few words, perhaps. Yes. Well, I'd just like to add on the issue of uh, SDGs uh, benefiting uh, women, uh, whether it is on related to rights or to development or to peace and security, any progress will benefit women. So women need to see progress across the board. Our own study as UN Women a, a, about two years ago showed that even though there were interventions uh, by, by member states and other actors to implement SDGs, the scale was small 
and the pace was slow. Our conclusions from our report was the need for acceleration and for scaling, scaling. up in order for us to stop the backsliding that we are facing. We also identify uh, young women between the ages of, in the, of, of 15 and in their twenties as the most affected women because that is where they tend to get into childbearing age as well as the need to enter the labor market. And usually at that time, they have the burden of care, which is unpaid. And if they leave the children uh, to enter the labor market, they enter at a very low level. And the journey to poverty starts then, and it never stops. So we need to do something about that age group. This was our finding in the US, in Nigeria, in Pakistan. So you can see how varied these countries were. That's just that cohort of young people because of childbirth and motherhood just turns around their capacity to get out of poverty in a, in a, for the long term. So it, it is a targeted uh, age group. Thanks. Thank you so much. And before we close, just to call your attention to the call for action. And just take a take a look and uh, the numbers of, of, of uh, signatories are, is uh, rapidly increasing and as uh, Helen uh, mentioned I think it, it is a, you know you know rather a modest contribution but it really tackling the issue of the need for parity and the need also to tackle uh, all forms of violence and discrimination against women and to push especially the younger generation uh, to uh, re uh, be audacious enough to be in politics uh, and to be prepared for that. So, Thank you very much. And that concludes our press conference for today. Thank you for coming. And uh, we'll be on our YouTube channel and also on a webcast. Thank you.